Tuesday morning, yeah. Wow, seems like a long time ago. But um, so we did a coffee clutch on Tuesday noon, um, which was you know open to any and everybody. And um, we thought we would take some of those topics, go in a little deeper here. And so tonight is really to help uh, parents with um, uh, primarily 11th graders, but if you have you know, a sophomore or a freshman, that's great that you're here, um, kind of talk to you about all the changes that have happened over the, it's just amazing too, it's only over the past six months, these changes, yeah. but they are really you know, um, having long standing effects on admissions. And these will, some of these things will definitely be um, permanent changes. And even if these other ones are permanent, they're kind of just changing the structure of what's happening in college admissions for good. And maybe, you know, for like, un we don't know yet if some of these are going to be good. Right. Um, so we thought, honestly, as parents of 11th graders, now's the time for you guys to start to understand this. Um, and so that's why we are starting to have these um, sessions um to go over some topics and um have, if you guys you know want to ask questions this is great so this is not like a traditional webinar because you know we can see you if you want to unmute you we can hear you um and, but we are going to present so um my only housekeeping is if you are not talking um just keep yourself muted if you want to ask your question in the chat that's fine i'm looking at the chat if you want to raise your hand and ask it you know you know with um verbally that's fine too so um we'll take your questions however you want to ask them um and um i'm going to my only other little tidbit is um uh I actually, Russ and I both have kids who are high school seniors. So um, besides kind of, you know, always being on top of what's happening and helping lots of different people, we are living and breathing it ourselves every minute these days because October, I mean, so for you guys with families, with kids in 11th grade, you'll know that like kind of October, November, December, it's just it's a lot. And so I am really, literally, um, I was helping my own son today with essays. We have lots of decisions to make. So um, we know where everybody is coming from because we, you know, feel it personally ourselves. So with that, Ross, I'm going to turn it over to you. Introduce yourself and we'll get started. Great. Okay. Hello, everybody. Good evening. Hope everybody had a nice weekend. Hope everybody's healthy and safe. Um, I'm Russ Vitale. I am an independent college counselor and have been for now. This is my 16th season. Uh, I'm based in New Jersey, but I work with students uh, all over the country. I am also, for the last now three years, uh, I am the college concierge for Road to College and Paying for College 101 with Debbie. Um, you know, and it's, it's interesting. I, I get asked all the time, like one of the number one questions I get asked is, when do we start, right? And I, I wrote a book, it's over my shoulder there, but you know, college making the complicated easy. I'm not a big stress guy. Like I don't think this whole thing, despite the business I'm in, I don't think you need to be crazy about this and fanatical. And some of you are saying, yeah, right, sure, right? But, but and I wasn't that way and I'm not that way with my own daughter, right? But at the end of the day here, there's, there's a right time and then there's probably a not so much, right? So. I find that way every year, and one of the challenges that Debbie and I always have is to try to get people engaged in the process, not where you're panicking and eat, living and breathing this stuff 24 seven, but at least where you're becoming more of what we call an educated college consumer. And try to do that earlier. And I think personally, the reason we're doing this now is because so many parents have reached out to us from the coffee class, and especially now with what's going on with the pandemic and the impact and all that, this is this is imperative you have to be included now not just to spend a ton of time on things but to just to be under educated to what your options are and how to successfully kind of navigate your way through the process without letting all the panic that you're going to hear from so many people online and sometimes it's you know it's people who think they're helping and they're not other times it's opportunistic people who are trying to you know make some money but you know, you want to make sure that you can kind of see through all that and apply what is going to help you to be efficient time, effort, and money that you're investing in the process from now until your child actually decides to go to college. 
So that's kind of why we're, we're doing this and we have been doing this. We've done a bunch of them starting back. I think we started back in March, right? Yeah, yeah. Yep. Uh, and went through uh, through Memorial Day. And then we did a bunch of other things as well. But I think 11th grade is key for so many reasons. Um, but we're going to cover some things tonight and hopefully it'll help you. And, and like Debbie said, please definitely make sure that you uh, ask questions um, as, as it's appropriate for you. Okay. So, um, all right. So this is our junior family. You can see that Debbie, right? Yes. Yes. It's okay, coming back out. to school update. Okay. So again, welcome everybody. So, you know, if you've attended the coffee clutches, these are the different things that we've been talking about. Um, I'm not going to go line by line through all these kind of things, but um, there's a lot of instability in the process. There's a lot of instability in financially, you know, for some of these colleges. Um, there's a lot of changes regarding ACTs, SATs, and all that kind of stuff. If you are a junior parent right now, you might be thinking, you know, do I have my child take a test in October or in November? Do I have them taken in December? Or should I just wait until all this mess kind of hopefully cleans up and maybe, you know, do it later? But then are we late? You know, and I always talk about the testing process and we're going to, you know, talk about a little more detail, but you have to remember the testing process is not a race. Okay. Don't worry about what everybody else is doing. Do what's right for your child and your family. And believe me, there'll be opportunities for you to take as many tests or your student to take as many tests as they need or want to take, okay? So I understand that sometimes we're in a little bit of a panic mode to do things, but just relax on that a little bit. I suggest right now, there's a lot of seniors that are still not able to take um, their tests yet. So if that's the case, I would try to stay out of that mix. Tests are being canceled still left and right. I think I would wait until after January 1st. That's what I would do. You can obviously do whatever you want, but I just wanted to make sure I covered that um, briefly because that's something that's kind of immediate for a lot of junior families at this point is to trying to think whether or not you should actually start tutoring, which tests to take and all that kind of stuff. Um, can, I, can I make one comment, sure, Russ? Absolutely. Just, uh, just for about that testing. And um, it was a little bit new to me, but uh, because of all the issues that's happened with testing, schools, individual schools, public or private, doesn't matter, um, are, are now actually taking on the opportunity to have school-specific, um, like SAT, SATs and ACTs just for the students in their schools. Like they can now do that if they want. So I just throw that out to you as parents. Like, you know, at some point, maybe not now, because, you know, but, um, like later in the year, if you might want to bring that up to your school um, as something that they want to look into, or if that's a possibility that they could offer. I just right, throw so it out. To, to, to basically host an SAT or ACT in your actual high school. Yes, yes, yes. Which is, and, and, and they do, and they can, I forget there's a name for it, but it, it all, then it would only be for the students at that high school. Well, exactly. That's what I was going to say, where they have ownership of the safety aspect of things. They don't let people from out of town to come in. It's purely the protocol that, especially if your school is in some kind of a hybrid mode right now, you know, some people might be home and all virtual learning, but um, there's a lot of schools that are right now do like AB days and on off weeks and all that kind of stuff. So there's protocols that they already have in place. So being able to administer an SAT or ACT um, at the school is probably very realistic and probably the most opportune time to actually take one and make it actually happen. So that's, that's a good point, Debbie. Um, you know, a lot of kids also from college uh, are taking classes from home, right? So um, that you have to understand that that's not the ideal way to obviously go through college. But at the same time, colleges are also taking major, major revenue hits as a result. Um, and that's going to impact a lot of different things, which we'll talk about in a minute. And then the other aspect is definitely as to whether or not, um, you know, financial aid is going to be impacted. And, you know, we have a lot of different cases that we've gone through. And then uh, I obviously am experiencing it right now with my clients as well as my daughter. And um, so far, I have to tell you, I have not seen any schools change their financial aid strategy or process uh, dramatically in the negative. Uh, if anything, actually the class of 2020, uh, my clients, some of them actually got incentives to commit before or on May 1st uh, last year, because I think, you know, the colleges are thinking a discounted seat is definitely better than an empty seat, you know? So, um, so I, I'm, 
there's still talk as to how you could decide, especially if test scores aren't there, how you decide somebody to get merit versus not or honors program versus not and those kind of things. But um, thus far, I have not seen anything. And I think us having the knowledge, Debbie, over, the, over this incoming year, you know, of what we see the outcomes and the, and the actual changes, school specific and just, you know, class specific, I think are going to help us to be able to share more information in the future with our, our members, for sure. Yeah, no, I, I agree. And I think um, the, and again, you know, this is, nobody has the crystal ball, you know, for this year. So um, some of this is hypotheses just from, you know, kind of like people in the industry, experts sort of say, and what they are predicting actually that is that um, uh, merit aid won't necessarily actually decrease uh, because um schools want to make sure those kids come so if anything in some cases it might actually increase to sweeten you know the offer to make sure that they do come so right. well we will let you know for sure so just so a little bit of a mindset maybe adjustment or to make sure we're all on the same page these are some some things that you know may sound obvious but you know sometimes as parents and definitely our kids lose track of these sometimes so First off, anybody who's heard me say anything or do anything with Debbie, you know that this is my thing. It's in my book. It's, it's something I refer to all the time. And it sounds so obvious, but the college list drives everything. And a lot of students put a list together based upon just, you know, what ratings and rankings, perception, what other people are doing. But the schools, the specific schools that your child's going to be applying to, impact their ability to get in, the affordability from your perspective as a parent and family, also the process as far as early action or decision, rolling, all those kind of things. But it also drives the workload as far as essays and supplemental essays and application work and all that kind of stuff. So again, try not, and listen, I know it's fun to go travel and see schools and everybody wants to go see Wake Forest and Duke and whatever. Awesome. Have fun. But that doesn't mean you have to apply there. Okay. So, and there's nothing wrong with those schools, but you have to make sure that you understand the admissibility quotient, the competitive quotient, and the financial quotient for those schools before you apply. So not to bust the bubble. I like to visit. I did a bunch of visits with my daughter as well. We also had a bunch canceled. Um, and it is a fun thing. But um, obviously, you know, I had the conversation with her to make sure that, you know, she understands all those quotients and how they play into our family process. A happy student is a successful student. Again, I know that sounds obvious, but at the end of the day, if I were able to tell you that two years from now, when your child goes to, to college, that they're going to be happy, I think as parents, all of us would sign on the dotted line right now, regardless of what that name of the school was, regardless of what anybody thinks about how great it is or not, or that's not a good school or whatever. People like people know, give me a break. So to me, I think, again, it's very important to match the school to your child, not just based on the name, but based on a, a place where your student will be challenged, but not overwhelmed. Also, Duh, but college is one of the largest investments in your life, and it can be really significant. Um, we just did a uh, FAFSA um, training program. Um, Debbie did one for the whole group. I did one for the concierge group just before I got on this call, um, special for them. And um, we did an example of, you know, a school that costs $72,000 a year now. You know, every year it goes up and up and up. So, you know, all in, I think it was like $314,000 over four years. Like, I don't know, some people don't have houses that cost that much. So it's really important to be smart and be an educated consumer. We all want to give our children what we can. However, they have to be the best student that they could possibly be. And they also, you know, is it worth taking on incredible amounts of debt? you know, for the bumper sticker or the diploma you put on the wall. I don't know. That's a family decision, but you have to talk about it and get educated, which is why, again, and that's, I believe, how Paying for College 101 actually started in the first place, to try to educate people on that financial process. It's not the fun part. It's not what a lot of people want to do. I see a couple of you, uh, and God bless you, and that's great, having a, a little sip of something as we're having this call. Uh, you might want to make it stronger when you're having that conversation or discussion, um, <laughs> but I think it's definitely worthwhile to do, and, and you don't want to you know, do it at the last minute, because that's when disappointment and other things can come in. 
ignore water cooler talk and please don't get involved in bumper sticker envy. I tell people all the time, you know, a bumper sticker is no good if after the first semester you're scraping it off because your child was not happy there, you couldn't afford it or they had a bad experience, right? So, and, and by the way, 51% of college freshmen transfer or drop out, 51%. That's huge. None of us are going through this process the way we're doing it saying, oh gosh, I hope my daughter or I hope my son transfers or drops out next year. That's crazy, right? So don't get caught up in the ratings and rankings. I think they're a complete waste of time. Um, don't get caught up in what your neighbor thinks and what anybody else thinks, because by the way, nobody knows. I know a whole heck of a lot about this because I do this and I eat, live and breathe this. And I, when people tell me, oh no, that's not a good school, I just laugh most of the time. I'm like, hey, okay, whatever. Yeah. Because I know just as many kids who are at name schools that everybody thinks is so awesome, that were miserable, had a bad roommate experience, couldn't get a job working at Lululemon. Not that there's anything wrong with that. I like Lululemon, but I don't think I want to pay $300,000 to have my kid work there. Um, and I have a lot of kids that go to schools that you don't even know or are at a state school that are making $150,000 a year now. So, you know, again, it's not a direct correlation it can be, but it's not, nothing's guaranteed. So again, just keep the right perspective. And then just remember again, college is supposed to be a journey, not a destination. Be efficient with the time, effort, money, peace of mind. Try, your kids are gonna be very stressed. And the way to try to do, you know, keep that at a minimum is you being educated, support them, be flexible, but also be real with them in my opinion. So um, a lot of things are, are happening right now, but you know, to make some stay at home progress, these are some things that I, I'm suggesting here. Um, you, know, you definitely wanna narrow down and that's the biggest thing, right? How do you narrow down um, your list from 3,800 schools or whatever the number is, depending on which data source you use, down to 10, 20 or 30. So um, we have a couple different things that we, we offer for that, but Bottom line is do your searches, do your research, don't look at what everybody else is doing and come up with your criteria, right? So the criteria is academic, non-academic, financial, athletic, if it applies, it's things that, and be realistic about that. There are a lot of great students out there, but you have to also understand that they're gonna be competing against a lot of other great students at these different schools, which makes it more competitive, which means money might not be available, which means that they may not get in, they may get waitlisted, deferred, all those kind of things. But also even from a non-academic perspective, you wanna make sure, again, it's the right academic environment for your child to learn, not feel like they're not good enough, not struggle and, and just trying to survive. Because at that point, they're not having fun. They're not making the context that they need to. They're not utilizing the resources available to them to get those internships and fellowships and research opportunities. They're just worried about just making it through to the next semester. Um, so you need to think about that. And the athletic process is a completely different animal that if any of you have questions about, I can try to help you out with that as well. Um, there are a ton of virtual information sessions and tours and um, don't just do the generic ones though. Also look for if your daughter or your son is thinking about being an engineer or thinking about doing something in the health science field or wants to be an artist or wants to do something in music. A lot of these schools have really gotten very good at doing uh, major specific um, virtual sessions. And I would definitely not just, because again, if you go to do a tour online, they're not gonna show you the ugliness. They're not gonna show you that if you walk out the back exit, there's like broken glass and you know, it's ugly city urban environment there, right? So most kids are not gonna look at a tour and go, that school's terrible, I don't wanna go there. Look at the more specific information, let them get educated, take it all in, learn about the different majors, learn about how the, the school operates. And I guarantee you, they'll be change if they're listening with an open mind, they're gonna realize, wow, I always thought that school wasn't that good, but I don't even know if I can get in there. It's a little bit of a reality check, but it also adjusts their way of thinking so they're more open to, to all the things we're talking about, about putting a list together. Uh, contact coaches um, for their suggestions on how to keep things rolling. Um, if you have anybody that is a recruited athlete. Seniors were given the opportunity to stay at college for an extra year at a lot of schools. 
Um, so placement is kind of being moved around, but uh, international students are not being recruited as heavily as they were because of the pandemic. So it actually may wash out a little bit, but definitely make sure you stay in contact with coaches. Um, you know, train, stay motivated, and don't learn bad habits. I, I will tell you, there's so many, I have so many seniors now that are staying home. And I see when on their, on their schedule, when they put it on their common app, I go, hold on a second. For the last two months, you had a guidance college class. What is that? Oh, yeah, they give us every uh, three days a week, they give us 45 minutes to work on college applications, essays. And I'm like, then what are you doing? Because you're obviously not doing anything in that class to help us get further on this. So what's going on? So um, I, it's hard. I understand it's hard to get really motivated at home. But just, you know, try to make it fun if you can for your child active. I, I'm a big believer that physiology drives the mindset. So have them get up and do some things, walk the dog, go for a quick run, ride the bike, do something, but get them active. Don't have them just roll out of bed and, or worse, you know, just wake up, hit the computer and staying in bed, taking classes. Um, contact your high school to make sure you're updated and agree with their actions. Um, you know, you'll definitely get hopefully a good sense of what high schools are doing and whether or not you feel comfortable with it. Um, and then also contact, uh, you know, you're probably spending more time potentially with your child than you ever have in the past, uh, especially if sports is not, and that hopefully should be a good thing. I mean, personally, it's been a great thing for me and my daughter. I, I, I really enjoyed it. Uh, we spent a lot more time talking about the college stuff, but also talking about life and just different things. And uh, hopefully you're doing the same, but you know, you don't have to bring it up in a, in a stressed environment. You could just say, Hey, you know, have you thought anything about college? Look, we're not going to get into detail. Just to anywhere you think you think you, you have an idea what you think you might want to major in anything you think you want to do, you know, and help them with that. Because I find a lot of students don't want to talk about it because they feel overwhelmed. They also feel obligated that they have to go to college, but they are also afraid because they hear how competitive it is. They hear how expensive it is. They're afraid to either disappoint you or disappoint themselves. So try to make that conversation a little lighter, a little easier if you can, and try to have a, an honest family assessment and do a family inventory. So specifically when we talk about the SATs, ATs, APs, all that kind of stuff, right? Um, look for updates. I, unfortunately, the communication that I've heard has been absolutely terrible in a lot of ways. I've had kids actually show up the, the morning of at 7.30 in the morning only to be told that their location was closed and they got no notification, which is terrible. Um, but, you know, I would, as I always say, I, I, as I said earlier, I, I would kind of wait until things you're hearing in your area, a steady flow of tests actually being administered, then you can start potentially planning. Um, hopefully, you know, there, there isn't going to be the setback that a lot of uh, people in the medical field have been saying in October, there was a talk about a potential recurrence, um, hoping obviously that that's not going to be the case. Um, but uh, I would just pay close attention um, to schools that are administering tests. Um, a lot of AP tests were normal, but also a lot of them were online. Um, so, you know, I think that eventually these uh, SAT, ACT organizations are going to have to move to that process. The whole thing is how to keep it legit where there's no cheating and all that kind of stuff, which is the, some of the challenge. Um, if you're thinking about tutoring and all that, I'm going to just tell you right now as junior parents, I find it very, very rare, and Debbie, I don't know if you have a comment on this, but if a student takes a test before December, typically they're not gonna do as well as they are eventually going to do on the testing, on the, on the individual test. So to me, I just find that, again, it's not a race. If your child has already completed Algebra two completed, meaning sophomore year, they finished algebra two, then technically, sure, they can take a test earlier if they want in the December timeframe, but do they have to? No, there's gonna be plenty of opportunities. Now you can test in the spring, the summer, the fall, there's plenty of opportunities to do it, okay? And there may even be more opportunities as um, tests continue to be canceled and the ACT and SAT organizations try to get more flexible and allow more opportunity. And that's important because you don't want to overspend on tutoring services. You know, most of the time, if you go to a tutoring center, which I advise, by the way, all my clients, whether it be on the concierge group or individually, I advise them to go to a tutoring company to take a free ACT 
and a free SAT. That way we can compare, we can find out which tests they liked best or hated least, find out the timing aspect of things, see you know, which is the right test, and then start thinking about when they should be taking those tests. But, and not all, but I find a lot of tutoring companies like, no, no, we should start now. We should start now. Now remember, tutoring companies have taken a hit as well during this whole thing. And I feel for them, I do. But that doesn't mean that you need to tutor for a year and a half. Okay, so I think you need to be very smart with that and make sure that you're, you know the right time to start tutoring for your child, how to be smart and efficient with it, and don't just take their word for it because I will find, again, that nine times out of 10 at least, the, the tutoring centers will suggest you start right away. Communicate with admissions contacts. Um, we always, we talk about the importance of doing what I call a vertical visit versus a horizontal visit. Um, definitely should find out who the admissions contact is for your child's high school, for the schools they're interested in. And that's a great opportunity to reach out, get some information. You know, you want to try to not ask mundane questions that are already on the website. Um, but, you know, making that contact so that way you're in up to date on the changes and things is very important. And then follow testing guidelines to be prepared for your next test, of course, but know when those tests are. And again, I'm just telling everybody, unfortunately, and we don't love this, but we all need to be kind of flexible. So we're gonna to need to probably add a test date or two potentially in the summer, maybe in the fall of senior year. I mean, it's just, unfortunately, the effect, even if this whole pandemic thing goes away, the effect, whether it be from a college standpoint, whether it be from a financial standpoint, whether it be from a market standpoint, meaning the stock market, is it's gonna take three to five years for, for things to recover. At least that's most of what I've seen. So I don't think it's gonna take that long for your child and obviously you won't care as much because by then your child will be in college. <laughs> but at least for this year, I think unfortunately we just need to be flexible and just expect to add potential test dates. So, so Russ, there's a question about, um, oh. It, well, first of all, is the PSAT like the SAT and should um, my student be taking a practice? Like should my student study for the PSAT? Yeah, so um, first off, the PSAT and the SAT are similar, but they're not exact. The, the scoring's different, the questions are different, a little different. Um, you know, and I, I don't really wanna get into the detail of how they are, but uh, at least not on this call, but um, your child should definitely be taking the PSAT. But ideally, again, if your child, child has not completed, then there's, in my opinion, there's no studying that needs to be done. There's nothing that you need to worry about. Oh, I would Russ, just, you know what? Just repeat that because you cut out a little bit. I don't know if it was okay, just I'm me sorry. or everybody cut out. Yep. Um, if your child has taken Algebra 2 last year, finished its sophomore year, you could technically have your child prepare for the PSAT to see if they could potentially qualify for national merit. Now, national merit means that you're in the top 2% in the whole country from a score perspective. You know if your child has the potential to do that or not. But if your child, it's the first test they've ever taken, you're not sure, you know, oh my gosh, he just said that maybe we should prepare. If you didn't do it, don't worry about it. It is literally, it, it's not a practice. It actually stands for preliminary, but in my mind, it's still a practice, okay? Uh, just don't send the scores to anybody, and I wouldn't, I wouldn't lose a lot of sleep over that. So um, colleges, there's a lot going on there. I'm not gonna go through all this, um, but they, there's a lot of rumor, a lot of panic. Um, you know, I think the biggest thing is honestly, one of the biggest things is down here, the result of uh, cutting back extra services. Extra services, yes, can be sports, but it also could be uh, mental health services. Uh, psychological services, it could be tutoring services, it could be a lot of things. So it could be special diets that maybe your child might need, uh, gluten-free or if they have food allergies, you know, no peanuts and all that kind of stuff. Um, so you really need to understand how the specific colleges are impacted in handling the, the financial cut, uh, setbacks that they've had. Um, also, you know, I, I don't know, and I know Debbie, I don't know if you have anything about this update, but Debbie um, did um, a Facebook Live uh, a while ago when this whole thing was going on about gap years to try to educate people on what a gap year is and what it means and all that kind of stuff. Um, I think, you know, not necessarily the people that Debbie had on, but, you know, there was a whole bunch of things kind of around that time where people were like, I think, a little opportunistic and saying that up to 20% of 25% of college kids are not going to go. They're going to take a gap year. I, I don't know one of my students that took a gap year. Um, I actually don't know one of my friends 
kids who have done it. Um, I'm not saying that that doesn't mean that uh, people do it, but I think it, it's greatly exaggerated in my opinion. Um, and I don't know, you know, just because a child takes a gap year doesn't mean that the college has to accept them back when they're ready. Because again, they need revenue now. So Debbie, I don't know if you have anything to add on, on the gap year aspect of things. Um, I don't, we, like kind of the, the numbers are still rolling in, meaning, you know, meaning um, as colleges are now announcing like the enrollment numbers that, um, you know, happened in the fall. Um, and there's definitely schools and, and probably across the board that are saying that enrollment is a little down than what they expected, but I don't think it's actually significant. So actually I was on a call on Friday with a um, college dean and they said their normal gap year requests are 4%. It did go up to 10%, but they also said that um, part of that were international students right. uh, because they really honestly didn't have a chance. They don't have a choice, right? They, yeah. they, they can't come, so they are deferring. Um, and what he didn't break out, which it was kind of interesting, and, and I, I mean, I, it was a big webinar, so I didn't put him on the spot, but of those numbers, um, how many were actually from upperclassmen? Because I actually have heard more upperclassmen kind of deferring their year um, than I have heard freshmen. Interesting. Uh, so, um, so in, unless the school really breaks out the details, it's kind of hard to know. But the other point of that conversation that this dean said is that, you know, this is his job, right? And he's, he can't give you a definitive answer about like how the numbers are going to fall out because they're still falling out, you know? Right. And so he said he won't know until the spring. But his point was not to let that worry anybody because they're going to probably end up having to maybe even take more kids than they might normally because they have to fill those seats. They have to kind of, you know, if they've lost revenue this year, they're going to find a way to kind of make it up. And if, even if that might mean expanding um, next year's class, you know, so. Right. Well, especially now with the virtual learning aspect that they're forced to do, they could offer some hybrid of those. Um, the other thing too is um, a lot of colleges because of the you know lack of travel and all those kind of things are actually utilizing local hotels and 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 hospital you know different areas where they can actually house people um you know where to kind of help their infrastructure to actually have more students so um i i do think and, and we always bring this up i mean cornell last may before the may 1st deadline took like 99 kids off of their wait list which was pretty much unheard of we have never heard that before and there are some students of mine that did get off wait lists of schools that honestly were significant reaches for them and offered um uh, admissions so um i i do think there's some potential negative impact but there's also a lot of potential positive as well assuming that that school is still the right school for your child. Okay, so if, uh, if you're out there trying to do this stuff on your own, um, which you definitely could do, um, I think you just need to make sure you pay attention to policy changes and, and not rumors, policy changes that actually happen. So, I mean, I'll give, uh, any of you live in Florida, there was a big, big deal about the fact that Florida schools did not agree to go SAT optional when so many other schools did. But I found that from my own daughter, but also from other students I've had, once you apply that they actually uh, sent an email saying that you can go SAT optional. So they didn't make it a broad broadcast kind of thing or a policy thing, but they actually did end up going uh, SAT optional. So again, that was, and that was big news for a very long time, class action lawsuits, you know, threatened all that kind of stuff. So I think again, Pay attention to what actually happens, not the rumors. Um, agree and disagree on criteria that's most important. Make sure, again, you and your student, your family are having talks to understand what is most important. You know, all the time I have students saying, I want to go to California. Again, I'm in New Jersey and predominantly a lot of my kids are in this area. And um, they say, I want to go to California. I'm like, why? Like, oh, the weather's so much better. You're not going on a four-year vacation, dude. Like, this is like, you know, you know, you can go on spring break to California if your parents let you for a whole lot less than $300,000, right? So, um, so I say that, but at the same time, I also say on the other end, it's very important to make sure that the criteria is right because the social environment is just as important, in my opinion, as the academic environment. Um, stay in communication with your colleges, like we talked about. Vocalize your concerns to high schools and colleges. And what I mean by that is 
you know, specifically my daughter's high school, they did a terrible job last spring. Terrible. For the whole time that she was home virtual, she had four in total, four Zoom calls. The whole time. Everything else was YouTube instruction. It was disgusting. It was a disgrace. This year, um, they, they did change. Uh, maybe a lot of my belly aching about it may have impacted things. But at the end of the day, I mean, you, you just even not just academically, but socially too, these kids need some socialization. Um, they can feel very secluded if they're at home all the time and not doing anything. And, and if you don't want kids to congregate and all of a sudden have, as I've heard of several high schools, have big parties where all of a sudden 150 kids come down with COVID as a result, then you have to kind of stimulate them at home to do something. So um, don't, don't be afraid of the fact that you actually obviously are paying the high school bill. So, you know, sometimes we lose, lose sight of that. Um, be flexible, like I said, understand the competitiveness quotient like we talked about, and then research using trusted sources and then confirm your findings. So research is great, the internet's great, all those things are fantastic, but I wouldn't take anything, even if you see it on a school website, I wouldn't take that as absolute 100% because believe it or not, some schools have not had time or have not kept their websites up to date. So definitely, definitely make sure it's, it's something to use as a red flag, maybe something that says, okay, we need to actually look into this, but I wouldn't take it as verbatim. I would always try to validate and clarify. So with all that's going on, you know, what do you do now, right? So um, there's a lot of different things that you can do. We did share some of them, but we wanted to make sure that we kind of really drilled something home to all of you. Um, you know, Debbie and I monitor and, uh, you know, we have some other folks too that monitor the um, comments and the, the conversations that go on on the Facebook pages. And it's just this every year, more people end up putting something like this into the, their posts. And it's really, you know, very discouraging because it's all avoidable. And this one happens to be about the financial aspect, which is very key and very important. But it also has to do with, you know, underestimating how competitive places are. Going and applying the wrong way, meaning not doing early action or doing rolling or not applying for honors or, or, or whatever. So, you know, staying educated and making sure that you're aware of your options is really important. And you want to do that now, which again, I'm so happy that so many of you are on this call today because now is the time. I have another saying, I've done this um, a presentation before uh, across the country for years, and I titled it, The Road to College Starts Now. And it absolutely does. So actually just to this point, Russ, oops, yep. if you go back. So, um, you know, and, and I, I will send these things out in um, a follow-up email, but, um, if you haven't kind of like learned about what your EFC is, I don't know if anybody, we can't, if you want to raise your hand, if you do know what it is, if you don't know, I mean, now's the time. Um, this, and this relates to the financial aspect. So, um, you know, EFC, expected family contribution, you know, you should, um, you know, figure that out and I can send you a link with resources about how to figure that out. Um, and then kind of, you know, that gives you an idea of, honestly, at a minimum, the college, what college is going to cost you. And then you can start to have that conversation with your child, you know, about, um, you know, what we're, what we can afford, what we're willing to pay. And it starts to kind of, you know, put some of these schools in perspective. You might still end up applying to a school that, you know, is, is maybe out of your ballpark, as long as you have others that are, are in your ballpark, but at least like, you know what you're doing. Um, so um, it's not, so I, I say this because um, we just recently did a, um, a presentation um, on the details of the EFC and how it's calculated. We just did, a pre as Russ said, a presentation um, this week about the FAFSA because October is when all these financial aid forms um, open up. And, you know, although the people that that's really geared towards are families with seniors because they have to fill out the forms right now. I think it's actually just as important for families with younger students to start to learn that stuff um, because that should really be part of like your whole process and decision making. So, and you know, we do see this um, comment all the time. It always breaks our heart because, you know, and it's, it's avoidable. 
You know, it's avoidable. We do, we do so much to try to help people to avoid that scenario. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, and the other thing I just want to point out in this comment, and this is a little pet peeve of mine, um, is the word dream school. So um, I uh, it personally, and I, I don't know, maybe you guys are starting to get, I, I mean, I'm, I get a lot of ads these days on Facebook from like college program services, whatever. And when they say the word, we want to help your kid get into a dream school, I just kind of laugh because that is just like, just that's not the terminology you want to be, you know, providing or setting. I mean, you don't want to set up like there is only one school that you can, you know, that that should be your dream school. And then and then you don't get into it. And, the, you know, the kid is all you know upset. It's just it's just the rat, bad language to use. So it, it is bad language to use. But again, as I said before, even with the gap year and other things about the opportunistic people that are out there, people understand and that's what I'm trying to you know and we're trying to kind of help you to hopefully not be that way but they understand that this is a very emotional psychological egotistical process and and actually when you had um what was the uh, author's name that you had on uh, Jeff Salingo uh, yeah Jeff Salingo he said exactly that that, that a lot of people, it, it, this is an emotional kind of decision rather than a true academic and, and financial decision. And, you know, so when people say dreams, you know, we all want our kids to be happy. I'm a parent too. I want to be happy, but I probably tend to be a little bit more real than some others. And I don't crush her dreams, but I do let her know, listen, you know, we live in a world where you're not owed anything. Like you have to do your job to be a, the best student you are and, and can be, and you have to do your part. And by the way, even with that, Sometimes you're not going to get what you want. So I agree with you. The dream thing and the play on words is, is really kind of, in my opinion, at this point, it's offensive, in my opinion. It's offensive. Exactly. Yeah. Okay. So what we covered tonight is kind of just, you know, the, the scratching the surface, right? Um, there's so much more to think about, and that's going to be impacted by this process. Um, and not, this is not to overwhelm you, but just to make sure that you understand that there's so much other stuff, some we talked about, some that we didn't yet, but at the same time also, just because we talked about it doesn't mean that you're done. That's actually when it starts, right? Because a lot of these things are very dynamic in the way they move and they change. So, you know, we try to help people with all these things through a lot of different things. We help with the Facebook lives that we do for free. We help with the concierge service that you're going to hear about in a second. We help with doing these Zoom calls and tell you about things. Um, so there's a combination of free things and also very low cost things to do. And by the way, some of you may not need help with all this kind of stuff, but regardless, you're going to have to address every single one of these bubbles and then some. So, what we were asked by many of our members is, is there any way that you guys can help us at an affordable fee, affordable rate that's not going to be ridiculous and where we can get some help? So what we decided to do is we created the Road to College Concierge Service. And in the past, we've started it in January for our classes, but we decided to start it early this year because there's so much going on and it's so critical that you stay on top of this and that you're smart and efficient and you gain peace of mind. So what we're going to do is you know, we're going to do a little introduction uh, of the service to you so you understand what it is. And just so you're aware, because so many people have said, I wish I knew this was aware. And we, we don't really push this too much, um, but we wanted to make sure that we at least shared it so you understand what it's about. So the service is for families with 11th graders. And it's, you know, the, it, it, the first session is actually going to begin on October 11th, which is next week, next Sunday. Okay. And bottom line is what it does is we stay with you from October this year until January of 2022. Okay. And that is through all your financial aid filing process, all your application process, all your essays, all your interviews. Um, it's through class choices. It's through all your testing. It's through every critical milestone. The only thing that isn't involved here is making your final college decision, which we do have services to help with that, but we didn't want to extend the service and have people feel like they had to be part of that. They can do that if they need that on a one-to-one -one basis for much cheaper. So um, bottom line is what we're trying to do here is, is we're trying to guide you and provide you what I call your GPS 
to college success and efficiency, to make sure that we, we can help you to be smart, know your options, understand how they may impact, how your decisions may impact you, and how we can help you. Now, this is kind of interesting. The study was done, I believe this was from last year, but a lot of people, and you're right, a lot of people think that getting a service like this is gonna be in the five, six, seven thousand dollar range. We would never ever do anything like that. The average price on the low end is basically $2,500. We're not there either. We're way below that. So what we did was, uh, and before we do that, we'll just talk about, you know, this service is not expensive. It's very comprehensive. Um, you can do this yourself. However, you're probably not gonna get the guidance and help and expertise from a guidance department and even from your high school, believe it or not. And if you're not sure about that, talk to your seniors, that you, senior families you know now. The reason why I've been in this business for 16 years is because unfortunately, guidance departments are way understaffed. They're not typically knowledgeable about college. And again, that's a general statement. It's not something that applies to everybody. And people need more attention. And especially with what's going on now, people need a lot more of attention. So what this does is we offer um, coaching sessions like this, but in a smaller group. Um, and what we do is we also provide tools and resources to help you through the critical milestones. We have email access that you can provide specific customized questions every month. And we also have a training session on uh, the big key things that you need to do and keep uh, aware of as you go through the process. So this is just something that somebody has just said to us earlier. Um, you know, as a member of the concierge service, we know that we're receiving valuable step-by-step -step guidance on a monthly basis and it, the important lessons allowed them to stay informed and less stressed. So they thought it was a great investment and they got the results they were looking for. So wanted to just cut to the chase and just let you know what the deal is is bottom line is, um, like I said, you have until noon on Sunday to enroll if you're interested. It's only $79 a month. Um, I don't know of anything in this industry that is so inexpensive and yet so valuable. I also have a very personal investment in it because I'm the college concierge and I answer every single question, give all my information. There's no holding back on things. There's no bait and switches. It is upfront um, available information. If I don't know the answer, which is rare, but that does happen sometimes, I do the research, I get back to you. It is very comprehensive. There's also, we're discounting the, we have a one-time enrollment fee typically of 279. We're discounting it to one, only 149. That's one time. And we're also, if you sign up by noon on Sunday the 11th, we're going to give you for free. We have a Build Your Perfect College List video program that helps you actually put your list together. That whole, your college list drives everything. That'll help you take you step by step through the process. It's um, documentary kind of thing by me with tools and all kinds of things that take you uh, through the process on how to start building your college list. So um, wanted to just share that with you. If you're interested, the we website down here is roadtocollege.com forward slash join varsity. And um, we are starting to kick it off. Um, this uh, next a week from today. And, you know, it is a little bit of a quick turnaround, but um, we did want to do it in September because that, that's literally back to school. But we know families, uh, you know, go through the transition there and sometimes get a little overwhelmed, especially this year, not knowing if it's, you know, online or in person and all that. But, uh, you know, really to be able to provide the value that we want, we wanted to make sure that we started it uh, sooner versus later. And um, but I'll just kind of tell you that, um, you know, when kind of usually when we start at the beginning of like these cohorts, sort of say, you know, like um, these groups of families, um, you know, you get uh, a few emails a month to kind of um, ask Russ, you know, um, if you have a particular question, you've actually lots of opportunities to ask questions, you know, um, at the monthly coaching session, you can ask a question at the office hours, you can ask questions, whatever, multiple questions, but then, you know, and it's completely understandable. If you have a very specific question that's related to your family or your student, and you don't want to share it in front of everybody else, you know, that's why we let you kind of um, send your own personal emails. And at the beginning, not that many, they trickle in. Let me tell you now, 
August, September, October, November. They are nonstop. <laughs> I, have been, I have been very, very busy. Yeah. <laughs> the other thing too is I just want to make sure you understand, unlike this kind of environment, um, I may have, I, I usually try to break up the session of doing, uh, during the training, uh, half training and the other half is all Q&A. And I don't end the session until I answer every single question. Um, then, you know, when we do the office hours, that is anywhere between an hour to an hour and a half as well. And that's all questions. So really, again, it's becoming like a nice kind of tight community of people going through things together. It's kind of nice to now we all know each other by name. It's kind of cool. Um, but I mean, I, there's no, there is not, you never have to think that, okay, well, how much, how personal can this really be? I promise you, it's very personal. Right. <laughs> and, and I also will tell you that if you don't get 10 times at least worth in value of what you're going to pay for this thing, then honestly, you didn't take advantage of my time, my expertise, my knowledge, and my ability to help you. Because the, again, you can't find this anywhere for access to somebody who knows what we know and has the resources that we have in Road to College and Paying for College 101. So, um, and, and we've gotten tremendous reviews uh, from this and appreciation from, from our members. Um, so, um, now more than ever, it's kind of time to start. So that's why we're offering it now. Uh, like I said, um, you know, in the past we've started in January, but we just thought this year is so key to, you know, with all the things that are going on. Uh, you can definitely visit for more information. You want to check it out, research it, find out what the components are, uh, concierge.roadtocollege.com. Um, if you have questions, you can email us at info at If you have any questions at all about this, how it works uh, and what the deal is. Um, so just wanted to make sure, again, that we saved that and sh shared that with you, because again, now is the time. And a lot of people have been asking us, we've been getting inundated with emails about this. Hopefully a lot of those people that have been asking about this are on the call today. Um, but uh, for those, if you, and you know, who didn't know about this, maybe, uh, you know, now you find how helpful it really is. So. But Russ, sorry, can I just, yep. there's a, um, a question about, um, do we help with essays, resumes? Um, maybe you want to describe how, I mean, you know, like, yes, I mean, so, we, we do, but then there's other kind of more yeah, in-depth so ways. One of the major things that I talk about, obviously, are obviously the essay, the whole essays uh, process. I have an essay helper that I actually share with the concierge group with, that includes sample essays, um, brainstorming techniques, and all those kind of things. People also ask me ongoing, uh, is this a good topic? Should I write about this? Whatever. But we also, so I answer all that and address all that absolutely in the concierge service. Um, and I can answer as specifically as I can, um, given you know the environment and the kind of questions you ask to give you very, very good guidance. But we also have some a la carte services as well uh, that are ridiculously inexpensive, anywhere from, um, I think it's, what is it, Debbie, $99? $99 to, $99 to $149, dollars, which yeah. Which is absurdly low. Like, good luck yeah. finding anybody who does that. Uh, again, I do that right now as well myself. But it's, it's video instruction. It's some a Zoom call instruction. So there's a lot of, if you ever needed additional guidance and customized help, personalized help, we do have the ability to put your college list together, essays, supplements, application stuff, um, resumes we talk about, um, but yes, I can review resumes. I mean, there's not anything that honestly I can't do um, because I've been doing this for 16 years um, and also do at a ridiculously discounted, low, inexpensive Price. So Russ, and the, another question is, which is a good question, and actually um, it comes up and we should probably make sure we um, comment on it in the future, is, is this service for kids or parents? Oh, okay. Yeah. So the answer is both. Okay. It'd be great if you as a parent had your child side by side with you to do this, but good luck. Right. So, so mostly we see the parents take the lead and there are some kids that definitely show up on the concierge. Like I had probably about seven, eight kids out of 50 that were on the, uh, the one that just before the session. Um, but also key point is, so parents usually take the lead. Um, but we also, every single session, the training session and the Q and a session each month is recorded and sent out via email to you. So, you don't have to always be available. 
You can have it also regardless for your records, but also you can go through it and you can fast forward or you can go wherever and have your child sit down with you and actually listen to a certain parts so they don't have to listen to the whole thing. Like it's very flexible and pliable from that perspective. And this is, a, I mean, a little bit maybe like my own personal philosophy, but I think this is like what it's part of it. I personally think that um, you as parents, you need to be educated on the process, you know, because um, you, you guide your students, you're going to be making some of these final decisions with them. So, um, you know, I think that a better outcome is when like the parents can start earlier to understand the process and then they guide their student into what they need. And then if like a student needs a one-on-one, -on -one, well, that's kind of, that's fine. Like that's an addition. That's a kind of like when you figure out when you, they need them and, and you know, the, that's like an additional piece that you might ask for. But I actually think if, us as parents are really well educated, you, you can manage the process very well. Yeah, I think you really can. And by the way, uh, if just in case anybody's questioning it, I'm incredibly fun and engaging on these things. <laughs> so the, um, the students like to actually participate. And I have found that, you know, once they do, they show up once, they, they show up every week, every month which is kind of cool. So, you know, it might be hard at first for you to get your child to sit there and participate, but, you know, I try to make this process as stressful as it can be, um, as fun as possible. I have some stories, I share some personal things, which sometimes, uh, you know, maybe go overboard with that a little bit, but kids find it entertaining and fun. So um, it, is, it, it is a way to really kind of add a little levity to the process while also being very efficient, getting a lot of great information. So, um, you know, the common mistakes that we will definitely make sure you avoid, take a picture of this folks, seriously, of this slide, because this is, this is what, and there's a lot more, but, but these are the big ones and these are the things that really could lead you to being dissatisfied. So, I don't know, Debbie, if we have any other questions or if there's anything else if, it doesn't have to be just about the concierge. If there's any questions about what's going on right now, anything at all that anybody has that they want to share. I didn't look at the chat, Debbie. I know you've been looking at it, but um, I don't know if there's anything. Um, I've answered a lot of questions that people had. Um, just kind of going back to see if I missed anything. Um, if anybody wants to unmute themselves and or raise their hand, you can feel free to do that as well. Oh, okay. Um, Sarah's asking, like, who is our typical family? Like, does it run the gamut financial background wise? It's a good question. It is. Um, you know, obviously the service, you know, when Debbie, if you ever, hopefully you read the, the emails that Debbie sends you, because they're actually kind of very informative and filled with the good stuff. <laughs> but at the end, you read the, at the bottom there above Debbie's name is, you know, she says her goal is to provide affordable services that everybody can afford and everybody can benefit from. And it's, I'm paraphrasing, but essentially that's what it is. So, you know, I, I will tell you that we, that if, if you're gonna have a hard time coming up with $79 a month, then you probably shouldn't do this. You will get tremendous value, but you probably, I don't, we don't want you struggling to come up with $79 a month. But if you're on the other end too, we're like, hold on a second, at 79 bucks a month and a total of 1500 bucks in total, this can't be any good. I'm sure I'm not gonna get that much help. I'm just telling you that's totally not true. Because again, I've been doing this for 16 years and I charge one-on-one -on -one a lot more than what I charge for this, <laughs> okay? And there's a difference, there is, but it's not a dramatic 180 degree difference. It's probably like a 145 degree and 180. Right, so you get this service is very, very, very comprehensive. So um, I, I do think it's for we've had all kinds of people, Debbie, right, and and a lot of the people who go to more selective schools or need to um, will do the add-on a la carte services. But there's no, they probably will not spend or come near even the the low end package average of twenty five hundred bucks in total. So never mind the seven, eight, whatever thousand that people charge out there. Yeah. But if I had to kind of like say typical, I would say, you know, and you're probably going to see this a lot now, it is the family who has figured out they're not going to get, you know, financial aid. Um, you know, may, they're not really not going to probably be able to cover the full cost of college. And so they're trying to figure out like something in between, um, you know, to find the right 
college at the right price, you know, at the right academic um, level and social situation for their kid and, you know, kind of um, want help making sure that whole mix works. Absolutely. You know, what I always say at, at, at a bottom line, and by the way, this is the bare bottom if you did nothing but just participate and listen. It is an insurance policy that you avoid the big mistakes and that you know what's coming next and you don't miss anything. At a minimum, at a minimum, that's like the bottom line. And I don't like to pay for insurance either, okay? But God forbid something happens, I'm pretty darn happy I have it. So if you, at a worst case scenario, that's how I would look at it as a very inexpensive insurance policy to make sure you're on task, don't miss deadlines, you're educated in the process, and you don't make the big mistakes that a lot of people make that could be incredibly costly. So um, Francesca's asking, um, how do you know your family who won't get financial aid? Um, so well, so it goes back to a few like minutes ago, I, you need to figure out your EFC and then it's going to depend on what type of schools your student is interested in. So the, the same EFC at one school, you might get no aid at another school, you might get a lot of aid. So that's kind of understanding the system, understanding the process, understanding how you figure out which schools give money. So it's, there's not a blanket answer. Um, that's kind of just, that's the, the learning process at, um, at the beginning that you, you need to kind of go through. Right. And that's, that's where some of the knowledge, again, of me doing this for 16 years, like I know specific schools across the country as to whether or not you're likely to get, I also, I use a proprietary system that I have that, you know, measures every school in the country in different ways. Um, including that, like somebody had just, uh, put in the chat, you know, is there a website? that I can find out, you know, what percent of aid or whatever I might be eligible for. It depends, it's school specific. It's school by school. So the EFC number that Debbie's talking about, which again, we do in the concierge service, we take you through that whole thing, teach you how to estimate your EFC, but also I take you screen by screen in different places so you can see where to get that school specific data of um, what percent of need would be met if they do give merit awards or not and all those kind of things. Yeah, so Frank is asking, is there a website that shows the percentage of needs based financing college actually provide? Um, yes. Um, and you know, it's not a secret. It's just um, a little bit of hunt, hunt and pecking. So um, there's something called a common data set, which I won't go into, but each school has that information on their common data set. Some websites provide the information about, um, you know, percent of, uh, of how much financing they give. So it's out there, but you just kind of need to know how to interpret it, how to look for it, how to compare it to other schools. Um, and so, so um, it's, uh, it's available. Actually, it's much more, it's much more complicated than it really should be, to be honest with you guys. I mean, it really shouldn't be, but, and, and that's why, again, you know, we have the services that we have to try to help you make sense of this stuff because, you know, you, you can pick your own stocks, you can build your own deck, you can put in your own sprinkler system, but you know, you got to become an expert on that for a temporary point of time. And that could be very costly. So we're trying to help you to avoid that if possible. So somebody is asking, is there anybody who could speak to the service who actually um, might have been in it? And I'm just looking through the list of names. I don't want to put her on the spot, but I saw that Angela, Angela, I don't know if you're willing to unmute yourself, is here. I don't know if, but, and to be fair, Angela, so we had a service, what we call the JV service, which was actually for, for families with younger students. And I, Angela, if I'm correct, I mean, you, you started out in the JV service, so you haven't really necessarily experienced this um, service for 11th graders, but I don't want to put you on the spot, but if you're willing, if you're listening, if you're willing to unmute yourself, I see that you're here. Um, but if not, I mean, we have lots of testimonials. I, we have videos, you know, we, we can send out. Um, I, I mean, I, we've gotten lots of, lots of, lots of lovely comments from people about um, their happiness uh, with, the service working with Russ, so um, we don't. I didn't specifically bring somebody tonight. Um, again, I don't know. I don't want to put Angela on the spot, but um, you know, we can. If, if that's if you wanted to talk to somebody, we could give you people to talk to. Oh, absolutely, easily. Uh, so somebody's asking, is there earlier access to topics that happen later in the twelve month time frame? A couple of schools that are being considered allow early submission in the fall, so we might like to get into some of the topics earlier. 
Yeah, so that's always, so we have um, our typical, you know, college calendar of things that we cover and what we do, but through office hours, through in direct emails, um, any Q&A that we have, you can absolutely, it's not like, if we cover something in, in March, it's not like you can never talk about it ever again. You can, like it's the, literally the, the office hours are an open forum for you to discuss, ask about anything, given exactly that, where you are in the process versus somebody else. And I would say, right, for Russ, vice versa, if maybe there's a topic you haven't gotten to and for whatever reason your family needs to know about it earlier, you could, they, could, they could bring it up and ask it's about it. The, it absolutely, it's very flexible in that capacity. That's why I make myself available. I don't just train, do the training and say, okay, see you later, guys. Like, that's what the Q&A is for. So you can get that personalized, you know, attention depending on where it is you are in the process. So, yes. We're very flexible. Like, like this, this service is not meant to kind of have you enroll in it and then find out that it's, it's restrictive. That's not the point. Like, again, this is not a bait and switch. This is like resource and, and availability, if you want it, to college expertise, guidance, support, peace of mind, if you want it and if you think it'd be, you know, advantageous for you. And in all honesty, a lot of what we put together and I think Russ mentioned this earlier, is honestly because people ask us. So, um, you know, this year we're doing something um, for um, CSS Profile, which again, you guys may, or don't need to know about yet, but to help people fill that out. That's because people were asking for it, you know? Like, so, um, you know, if there's something that's missing, like, feel free to ask and we'll figure it out. Yeah, we also, I, we also, I brought, I have a psychologist that I know that works with college students. Um, and I actually brought him on at the request of one of our uh, cohorts, because at the time, a lot of kids were going through a lot of uh, emotional challenges, you know, with- That was right, that was at the beginning of COVID. Yep, with all the whole COVID thing and all that. I mean, you know, if, if we listen to the group, I mean, you know, with our resource, that's another great thing is with our resources, we have access to a lot of experts. So uh, happy, uh, I'm not a, egomaniac and uh, at all uh, regarding that I can definitely bring other people in and I don't want to do a disservice to anybody trying to cover things that I'm not trained in so we, we it's very flexible in that capacity as well so a question about uh Russ how important is early decision going to be really moving forward for the next two or three years good question it is uh the answer is we don't know but i have to think it's going to be more and more important over the next couple of years because people need to guarantee seats are filled so a lot of schools that didn't have early decision are going to start having early decision a lot of a lot of them who had early decision one are going to add early decision two um and i also think that they're going to probably potentially accept a larger percentage than they already were early decision. So I, I think early decision, I could be wrong. I think it's probably going to be depend on the school and what their financial situation is. But I would I would definitely think early decision is going to be much more important over the next two, three years. I completely agree. I mean, it's kind of the only tool that a college has to guarantee their revenue, you know, a, you know, a good percentage of their revenue. And no, Francesca, early decision does not mean less financial support necessarily. You know, you, when people say that a lot of times it's because they didn't understand how the process worked in the first place. There are some schools, doesn't matter if you apply early decision, rolling, later, regular, whatever they want to call it, um, they don't give anything but need-based aid. So if your income is over a certain level, doesn't matter if your student gets a 36 out of 36 on the ACT, has a 4.8 out of 5, none of that matters. They just don't give merit. So, um, you know, and a lot of people say, no, we, they applied early decision, didn't get any money. It's not most likely because um, they applied early decision. It's because the school itself just has a policy that the, the people didn't understand. And so, and Donna, Donna's asking, and for those of you who don't know, early decision, um, if your student applies early decision to a school, they are committing that if they do get accepted, that they um, will go. So they have to withdraw any other applications. It's a contract. Put it, it's in a, the, in yeah. the Common App, it's a contract. The student right. has to sign, the parent has to sign, and the guidance counselor, by the way, has to sign. Um, and, um, you know, kind of what Russ is saying, you know, this is a year that's kind of shaking out, you know, like we're yeah, we're going to see, it's going to be interesting to see what happens. I'll tell you one thing that I learned um, just the other week. And I wonder, again, if this is going to be something that 
um, happens more broadly. Uh, there are a few schools calling, and this is my language, they don't really have an official name for it, calling um, uh, like a pre-read for merit scholarships. Um, so some schools now are saying, um, just like they might have done pre-reading for, I don't know, or, you know, I, I don't know, like, they don't, I mean, so you can ask a school to do a pre-read for financial aid, but they don't always love to do it. But okay. they, you could do a, an early read. They also do it for acceptance for athletes as well. Athletes, yes, yes, yes. But, but now they're kind of saying, and, and not a, a lot, I only know of three right now, that are saying, um, uh, will... If you send, if your child sends in their application, we'll look it over and we'll actually tell you in advance of you um, having your child actually submit what the merit scholarship is that you're going to get. So, I mean, things are changing. <laughs> well, yeah, you know, I have to say though, uh, for 16 years, I have anybody who's who's interested in early decision. I advise my clients to always meet with admissions and financial aid before they apply and make that decision to get what I call an early read because it's it's no different than buying a house, buying a car, buying a business. For that matter, it's no different than going into a restaurant. If you go into a restaurant and you check out the menu and say, you know what, I think I could probably pay about 25% of that, you probably should find a different restaurant. So, so it's, it sounds basic, but it, you know, people don't want to do that because it's our kids and we want to give them what we, what we can, and we want them to go to the best school, whatever the heck that means. Right. So, um, but you have to be uh, smart about that. And I agree, Debbie, I think I had heard that. I didn't know any that actually did it, but I had heard that more schools are starting to do that because it, it's a, it's a business. You know, I don't care if they say they're nonprofit, that's a joke that it's, it's a business. Uh, so one other person's asking, can you get out of early decision if the financial aid is off from what their website net price calculator? So you technically the one kind of reason you can get out of, uh, early decision is to say that, you know, the financial aid is not what you expected. Um, and you can't truly can't afford this. I have to say, I mean, yeah, they'll let you out. It is frowned upon. Um, it will not good, look good for your student. It will not look good for your high school. It's more, um, than, it's more than frowned upon. Yes, yes, yes. I mean, I have heard, and I'm not saying, I'm not making a comment on this, but I have heard that some high schools, if that's the case, and so, and I'll, so the reason why they're strict about it is because quite honestly, I mean, the schools that are going to give uh, early decision, uh, they're probably, their net price calculator is pretty very, very, very close to accurate. So, um, so they're expecting that you understand that before you, your child commits to um, early decision. And I, so I, I, what I will tell you is I know of high schools because it does, it does not reflect well on the high school, if that's the case, if a student pulls out, that say, we're not going to send your transcript to another school, another Absolutely. college. Absolutely. It, you know, you have to, it, it's not a joke. It, it's not something you should take lightly. And, and what I said before, about going to, a, if you went to a restaurant and you ate, you know, surf and turf and three bottles of champagne and all the, and then just said, you know, I can't pay for this. You're gonna get arrested. It's as simple as that. And you have to see it as, as this, this early decision is not a joke. And I have heard very vindictive schools find out somehow, some way of other schools that that student has applied to. And these colleges stick together. They call the other schools and say, by the way, I just want to let you know, Billy Smith just hung us out to dry for early decision. Do whatever you want, but I just wanted you to know. I, I, I'll just add one last, it's not, I mean, it's not a legal contract, you know, not, I've never heard to date that a college is going to come sue you. Um, so, but it's just, again, it's kind of like an ethical thing. But I will add one thing. If something truly financial happens and changes, you know, from when your child put in the application to when they actually find out, sure. I mean, Absolutely. you know, it, you know, you should bring it up and and make the college aware. Maybe they'll even adjust the package. So, you know, it's not like you're gonna you or your child's gonna walk away in handcuffs, but it's it's serious. <laughs> well, it, it's it's serious, but also so last year out of out of school, one of my students kind of was in that um, situation. Their early decision, got some money, but didn't get enough, went in and the school was very, very agreeable and ended up meeting their need and kids doing great now. She's just finished her sophomore year. So um, it, people have the, you have to do your homework ahead of time. You have to have the conversations ahead of time, but assuming that you do, 
you can definitely, you know, people think that early decision, there's like no room to negotiate or discuss anything or have any conversation. It's all or nothing. And that's really doesn't need to be the case. Uh, so Shannon, I, I just, I like your comment. The price on the menu isn't the same for all the guests and applicants. You're absolutely right. I mean, probably a closer analogy is, you know, like airlines where every seat is absolutely priced differently. That right. That's true. You know, like the kid in, in, in each class, every kid around you probably is paying a different price. Yep. No, that's definitely, and that's unfair and it's not cool, but it's the, the way it's been done forever, right? Uh, so Diane's asking about uh, um, back, uh, sci undergraduate science and MD programs um, in terms of kind of looking at those for um, their, her students. Yeah, I mean, we, we actually, we do discuss those. We don't get into excruciating detail. Like uh, we have a list navigator service that um, we provide that's kind of a a la carte service that we discuss um, to help people with that kind of stuff. But as far as, you know, the admissions um, landscape for that. Um, I don't think that that's changed at all. Not, at least not that I can uh, see or attest to. No, no example that I'm aware of. Uh, so another good question about appeals letter. Um, I saw that. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, absolutely. Um, one of the things I do uh, is coach people on appeals um, and how they can, you know, go back to schools and try to, you know, you never use this term in a college uh, office, but to negotiate and to see if you can, you know, optimize your offering, uh, be aware of all the options available to you. So yes, definitely that is, you know, I can't guarantee um, what you're going to get as a result, because obviously that depends on you, how much does this college wants your child um, and how you present things. But uh, yes, that's definitely part of the service. It's very, again, it's very comprehensive. It's everything. And actually to tell you the truth, What's more important is actually is that you think about all the schools that your student is applying to and that you might have one or two schools that you use in an appeals process, but you right. have to think about that in the fall. Right, absolutely. Well, that's where, again, that's where the list drives everything, right? It's a lot, whole lot easier to negotiate something if you have leverage in some way. Absolutely. So, um, I hope that, you know, we answered questions. You can always feel free to email um, myself and I forward on to Russ any other questions that you have in general about the service. Um, but, um, you know, we hope that uh, it's something that might interest you. And, you know, as Russ said, it's um, beyond a good insurance you know, policy. And, um, uh, you know, if not, we will, you know, see you around in general. And, you know, we still send out lots of information. But, um, you know, if, if you kind of want to get a head start uh, and uh, really be on top of things, because things are going to be topsy-turvy this year. I mean, I wish that, it, I have to say, so I mentioned I have a son who's um, going through the process now. I, he's the youngest of my three kids. And maybe I just had bad luck over the years. <laughs> Every one of my kids, when we went through this process, there were major changes that happened. My, not, and actually, well, this year is the worst, but the oldest um, it was the year that they changed up the common app. Well, oh my God, you would not have believed everything, all the glitches that happened that year. People were going crazy. Russ, do you remember that? Um, that the, you know, the websites were crashing, um, there were glitches. Kids would put in their essays, the essays would disappear. I am not kidding. That was like, you know, like happening. That terrible. Was, it was. Yeah, yeah. So that was my oldest. Then my middle one, I thought, okay, well, things will be better. That was the year they changed the SAT. So it was a completely new like SAT uh, format, the scoring. You had the, these concordance tables. This is what the old SAT was like. This is what the new SAT was like. I mean, and, and then of course now this year. So, <laughs> so you think that like, well, what, what can really change? But it is always changing. All right, I, I don't know if you saw this from Angela. Angela is very sweet, but she said, uh, hold on, just moved on me. But she said, um, where is it? I see it, I mean, I, yeah, can you yeah, Angela, Angela, who I didn't mean to put you on the spot, says, I've been part of the JV concierge service and have absolutely loved it. Russ and Debbie are completely phenomenal. Peace of mind on keeping on track. I've got to say, you and Russ rock. I absolutely love you for all helping us. Thank you uh, for all of your help. You're the best. Thank you very much, Angela. And Angela, that was very sweet. Very nice. Thank you. Yeah, and I didn't even know you were going to show up tonight, but I did notice your name, so. <laughs> <laughs> and see, but see, but that's what it should be, Debbie. If you're going to do this service, 
Angela's active enough to get the most out of this and get what she needs out of it. And, and she's smart enough to ask the questions and, and, and get and optimize the service, which is, believe me, I always say this to my students too. I always tell people and families, don't hire me if you're going to leave me on the bench. <laughs> like, I don't want to be on the bench. Okay. So unlike everybody else in the world, I actually want accountability and I want to make sure I help you. So, but at the same time, I don't live in your house, uh, which is good for a lot of you because I eat a lot, but <laughs> just, you don't want, you know, I need, you need to make me aware of what you need and I'll, We'll help you. So that was very nice, Angela. Thank you again. Um, and then uh, one last question, Russ, about uh, smart athletes, like how to work with them. Oh, with athletes? Yeah. So at the athletics, that's a little bit of a different process depending on your sport. But um, if you are a junior, depending on your sport, you could be late to the, to the parade right now. Um, you know, despite all the NCAA rules and all this other stuff, uh, depending on your sport, like I, I do a lot of lacrosse. Um, a lot of girls are committed, you know, freshman, sophomore year, which is absolutely nuts, um, despite the new rules and all that stuff. So the athletic process is definitely something different. We've definitely had some ath athletes thinking about being recruited uh, in the last couple of years of concierge service. Um, it would depend on how uh, how detailed in, in the sport and all those kind of things, how I can help and to what degree. Um, but I, I've had kids play every single sport at every different level, uh, including internationally. So I could definitely help with that if, uh, if you needed it. Okay, guys, anything else? Anything else we can answer? Catch the end of the basketball game, catch the end of the football game. Life is good. Oh, this is Angela. Say, I don't know what I'll do when I don't have you have kids around anymore. I'll have to visit <laughs> once in a while. But my youngest is in seventh there. You have a bit to go. Yes, I got. So I got to tell you what people. And this is made me more in the paying for college group. I've noticed that uh, when people's kids are kind of through the process, but they're still in college. First of all, they hang around because there's still lots of issues at least in the paying for college group. There's still lots of issues that come up when your kids are in college, for good or for bad. And um, I, I see that people love to kind of share back their knowledge because once you go through this process, you're like, oh my God, I got to help somebody else because now I know what it's all about. True, true. Well, and also, I mean, in all honesty, Debbie, too, we've talked about having some services as well for people when they're in college because there's a tremendous need. Even having services for people when they graduate college and need a job. Wouldn't it be nice if all your kids got jobs after you paid 100, 150, 200 or more thousand dollars. <laughs> so, so yeah, I mean, there's, there's, I mean, there's just not enough time in the day, unfortunately at the moment, but. So Emily's asking recommendations for best practices for replacing, I guess, for not being able to see schools um, and open houses. Yeah, we, we do. Um, we talk about a vertical versus a horizontal visit. Um, we also talk about virtual different ways to do that virtually. Um, you know, listen, it, I will tell you, a lot of people, feel, I mean, again, I know that's the fun part of the process, but a lot of people, honestly, they go in the visit, they look around, and then when I ask my, my student, what did you think about the school? Like, uh, I don't know, I didn't really like it. Why? My tour guide was terrible. I'm like, Ugh. you know, that, that's one person out of 3,000, 30,000, whatever, right? So I just find that, I, I mean, I get it. It's nicer to be able to see things and put the you know, name and face together, as they say, you know, in a different respect. But, but a lot of people don't do the visits the way they should. Anyway, it's not comprehensive. It's just glitz, glamour. And, you know, it's, I, and I tell my students, you're not buying a handbag or a pair of shoes. Like you have to do a little deeper dive. And a lot of kids and a lot of families are afraid to do that and don't want to get into that. So. I get that it's important. There are definitely ways to do it. There are definitely things that you can do to try to optimize from a demonstrated interest perspective. We, we talk about all that stuff. But, you know, if do the homework now so that way when things do eventually open up, you can be optimal when you actually get to go and you know exactly what you're looking for and you get real information, not superficial. It felt good. Yeah. So let me, and I'll just give you like a personal um, example. Uh, and, you know, again, I keep going back. My son is um, going through the process right now. And maybe this is the slight silver lining to COVID, but um, we have spent a lot of time, I think, digging deeper at schools than we have in the past when we just would go visit. And so I think the difference is when we would go visit, we kind of expect the information to come at us because, oh, they're up there. They're, you know, like the admissions people are right. telling us. But here we've had to kind of 
like um, find the information, but in a good way, we've had to dig to really understand um, the different requirements that schools have, their majors, you know, um, what, if you, you can transfer, you know, majors, if you start out in one school, can you, end, you know, can you um, take classes in another school? And um, on going to that level of detail, you really understand kind of the philosophy of the school, which you may or may not agree with, right? And, um, and this is going back to a comment that was made earlier. Actually, I think Russ, you made the comment about, um, you know, getting to know the admissions reps and the types yep. of questions to ask. Yep. When you do that type of research, you have questions and your questions stand out because it, they, they show that you have really kind of, um, you know, taken a deeper dive. They're not just the questions of, oh, can I double major? Oh, of course, you know, they're like, they're like, you know, I'm interested in this school, but I see any, you know, but I'm also interested in a few courses here. Can I really, you know, and, and, and then they realize, oh, this person's actually interested. They're not just like surface. Right. Yep. Definitely. It's that whole vertical versus horizontal visit that I emphasize. Yep. So, okay, guys. Well, um, can't believe it. it's like an hour and a half. Yeah. Um, so good to see everybody. We will Stay have healthy and safe, everybody, and hope to see you in the concierge next Sunday. Take care. Have Bye. Take care.